Welcome back. This is part two of chapter two. Let this mind be in you. We were on the chapter that is titled The Influence of Homer. And we went ahead and hopefully you did as well. Took a break. Got something to eat. Just got away from the screen for a little bit. Whatever. Um, we're going to go ahead and pick this up. There won't be quite as much on this video as there was on the part one. Uh, and so hopefully you'll hang in there with me and we can learn a little something more together. We paused at the point where Brad shared with us the background for the term Grecian or Hellenist. The term which was applied to many of the Jews during the time Yeshua walked among us. These terms represented a mixture of Hebrew ethnicity with Greek worldviews or Greek thinking. That is what exists in most places around the world today. Whatever the particular culture is, whatever the particular ethnicity in that culture, that environment is, there tends to be a strong mixture of Greek worldviews, Greek aspects, and subsequently Greek thinking or popularly termed Western thinking. We're going to go ahead and say another prayer. I like to invite y'all to be a part of everything that I do, even if it's simply a continuation of something that we already started. The fact of the matter is, it is another day. And so, although I did my personal prayer already, I'll be doing my couple's prayer with my wife here shortly. I'd like to go ahead and do another prayer with y'all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we thank you once again, Father, for blessing us with this opportunity uh, to study a portion of your word as we go through this book that you blessed us with. Uh, Father, we pray that you would allow our hearts and our minds to be intent on growing and being strengthened by what we learn here this morning. And Father, we pray that you would allow each of us, whether it be on this side of the camera or on the other side, uh, Father, to receive everything that you have in store for us. Father, we just thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Yeshua's name, amen. You can never pray too much. Brad writes next that the anglicized term or terms Greek or Grecian appear only once in the Tanakh in the book of Yoel. It's chapter 3 and it's verse 6. The people of Yehuda and Yerushalayim you sold to the Greeks so that you could remove them far away from their land. There's so much meat in this chapter, uh, this, the influence of Homer. It's difficult or it has been difficult to pare down or pare it down to highlights. But with the direction of y'all, we'll do our best to get this done. Let's go to this. Brad writes, 
I actually put the first page on top of the book. Nice transition, Mark. <laughs> and yes, I do often talk to myself and hold my little personal conversations. Joe gets a kick out of that for whatever reason. The ways of the nations in scripture represents a mixture of various ideas and views on how to live life. The Greek perspective provides us with a background as to the nature of a God or gods who desire to be worshipped, entertained, adored, and revered, but not necessarily obeyed. Does that sound familiar to you in any way, shape, or form? As I've continued my transition to becoming Messianic, Torah observant, Shabbat observant, more and more familiar with Hebrew culture, I realized that the way we approach Hashem, Yah, Adonai, is vastly different than the way he's approached from a Western perspective. Those attributes that I just read to you are attributes that I was very familiar with from my days, whether it be ministering or being a lay person or excuse me, being a child coming up in the so-called church. And it's actually fascinating to me how many things that I've read as I've done research and studied that are so familiar to me to what I was used to for most of my life. But it's also fascinating that once you begin to transition to doing it Yah's way, the way he's commanded in his word, the way he's taught us and instructed us to do in his word, how natural that becomes. But until the scales begin to be removed from your eyes and your heart become circumcised and you begin to take on the mind of Yeshua, not until that time does it become normalized. It becomes natural. Different people, different uh, rate of time in terms of transition. But as long as you're headed down the narrow path, the path that leads toward righteousness, the path that leads toward the body and the bride of Yeshua, the mere fact that you're headed in that direction, I believe that Hashem is pleased. If you do probative thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, or deep analytical thinking, I wonder if this brings to mind anything, what I just read. And of course, I just explained to you what it brings to my mind. I sit here reflecting on today's so-called worship, and that is exactly what this segment brings to mind. As I reflect on Abba, my Heavenly Father, His living and written word, it takes me to a place that is indescribable. <coughs> Excuse me. I felt that coming on. It takes me to a place that's indescribable. If you experience overwhelming humility and a sense of pure gratefulness, then you know that the Ruach HaKodesh 
is guiding you in true worship, which leads to obedience. And that's the thing. When you are truly worshiping in the form and in the fashion that we're taught by our Creator, the natural result of that, what it leads to, is obedience. Now, I'm not referring to the kind of obedience that has to do with you see a posted sign on the motorways and you obey what that sign says. You're doing that because you believe you have to. I'm not referring to going in a store, checking the prices, picking out something, and then proceeding to pay for it because you believe that's what you have to do. I'm talking about a kind of obedience that is unfamiliar to most of the world, to most of us, to most of mankind, which is one that's rooted in love, a love that's framed by respect. A love that's framed by belief. You believe what you are taught, what you are told through the word. And in some cases of those who are truly blessed, what you hear him speaking to you, you believe. And through that belief, naturally flows obedience. That's an obedience that's permanent. It's real. It's true obedience. When Yeshua gave himself to be a living sacrifice on the stake. It was out of true obedience to what he came here to do. When he challenged folks about their traditions following the traditions of man, he was doing what he came here to do out of obedience, rooted in love of the Father. He wanted to set an example for us. He didn't do things because he had to do them. He, do the, he did them because he chose to do them. You see, just like we have a choice, he had a choice. He didn't have to do what he did. But when love leads you to do a thing out of abundance of respect, it doesn't get much more pure than that. Something that is pure is effective. Something that is pure is real. And those who live in purity, those who live in holiness, which is a way of being separate from the world. When I speak of holiness, that's what I'm speaking of. I'm not speaking of some emotional state. I'm speaking of a conscientious effort, walk, of being separate from the ways of the world. That kind of purity, that's pleasing in the sight of Hashem. That's what my goal is. My goal is not heaven. I've already received salvation and continue to work that salvation through faith, which is action.
Those aren't my goals. My goal is to draw near to my Abba. My goal is to better understand him that I might be able to connect to him stronger and stronger and stronger day by day by day. Really, hour by hour. And I don't say that because it rhymes or it sounds good or would make a good song or anything of that nature. I say it because that's the way it is. He continues along that same line. In Greek mythology, the gods were to be revered and celebrated, but the intellect was to guide man in this life. We read in 1 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. I'll read to you the version that I have in the scriptures that I use. Same passage. Precisely because Jews ask for signs, there's accounts of that in the Brit Kadashah. And Greeks try to find Wisdom, that's their goal, is to find wisdom. Their goal is an intellectual pursuit. If you are studying scriptures in order to increase your degree of knowledge for the purposes of being able to prove to folks that you know the word, you're missing the point. The scriptures need to come alive so that they become anchored in your soul, in your heart, in your mind, in order that there might be a common dialogue between you and the Ruach HaKodesh, or in other words, between you and our Creator. in order that he might be able to minister to you, that he might be able to guide you. I wrote here the more familiar version of this verse from the King James Version is, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, both of which appeal to one's intellect. So in both accounts, looking for a sign, asking for a sign, seeking after wisdom, looking for wisdom, the appeal to the intellect. Most folks know that the Greeks are known for their philosophy. Back to Homer. From the first video, Brad writes this, the poems of the poet Homer set the stage for the creative writing of the Greek myths of ancient gods and goddesses. He brings up something that greatly disturbs me personally. Excuse me. The body's not cooperating this morning. <laughs> Maybe it's because of all the work I did on property yesterday. I don't know, but it's kind of creaking. <laughs> but he brings up something that greatly disturbs me personally. The idea of the logos. Why? Because I've actually heard more than one minister equate this with Yeshua, saying that he is the ultimate representation of the Logos.
I'm going to stay as calm as I possibly can as I share a couple thoughts about this. The idea of equating our Creator who visited the earth wrapped in human flesh as a representation of anything is insulting. It's disrespectful. It's so out of pocket that anyone who truly loves my Heavenly Father, anyone who truly loves their salvation, Yeshua, would literally get indignant and angry about that. But remember the scripture teaches us to be ye angry and sin not. Don't sin. Don't let it lead you to sin. So those emotions need to be held at bay. Because after all, we're not expected to live according to emotion. Regardless of what happens on Sunday mornings and what folks try to get you in a state of. That's not according to the word. That's according to the world. So my method, this works for me. I don't know if it'll work for you. I don't, you know, you, you have to do what works best for you with regard to these types of things. But as I continue to talk, I continue to relax, to calm down. So when I get to something that makes me a little upset, a little angry, a little indignant, I'll talk and it calms me. So that was one. It's disrespectful. It's flat out just wrong to think of Yeshua in such a manner. Secondly, it's misguided. It leads people in the wrong direction. If the path to and through Yeshua is here, Doing that leads you there, way off course. Now, that individual is going to be held accountable. The scripture speaks specifically about teachers who lead folks in the wrong direction. The scripture says there's a special place reserved for them with the adversary and his minions in a lake of fire. Scripture says that. This whole thing of the logos we have to understand is not of Hashem. It's of the world. And if it's of the world, it's of the adversary. Therefore, it should not be a part of where we want to go. Excuse me. We're going to get a bit more in depth on Logos when Brad spends more time on it in chapter 11. As he states... The nature or essence of Greek philosophy will be studied in detail later. 
Right now, our focus is to establish the fact that this philosophy made a major impact on the thinking process of the populations which Shaul encountered, uh, Paul the Apostle, and that this influence has stayed with the church, and he's got that in quotes, for 2,000 years. He also shares with us the following is a quote from the book Alexander the Great. In 342 BC, before the Common Era, Philip, Alexander's father, Alexander the Great's father, hired Aristotle at a handsome salary to teach philosophy which embraced both practical and theoretical knowledge. Lessons and seminars were held usually in the open air in the sanctuary of the nymphs near Mieza a beautiful place with natural grottoes in the limestone, which was visited by sightseers in Plutarch's day, and still is so visited. The influence of Aristotle on Alexander was profound. Let me read that again. The influence of Aristotle on Alexander, Alexander the Great, was profound. Alexander accepted as correct Aristotle's views on cosmology, geography, botany, zoology, and medicine, and therefore took scientists with his army to Asia. And he was fascinated by Aristotle's lectures on logic, metaphysics, the nature of poetry, and the essence of politics. Above all, he learned from Aristotle to put faith in the intellect. Place faith in the intellect. In their personal relationship, the boy's admiration developed into a deep affection, and they shared a special interest in establishing the text of the Iliad. Homer was the major influence on Aristotle. Homer was the major influence on Aristotle. Brad explores the influence of the great thinker on the great conqueror, who was also a great thinker later on in chapter 4 when we get to that. Chapter 2 closes with some interesting facts that I would imagine many have little or no knowledge of, little or almost no knowledge of. Let me read some of them to you. It was Homer who introduced, at least from the view of literature, the whole idea of mythology. At the whole idea of mythology and hero worship. This lies at the core of Greek society. I mentioned early on, I in part one, I asked a question or made the rhetorical question regarding courses that are available. And I mentioned the fact that uh, Greek history is something that at least at the college or university level is offered as, um, uh oh, what's that word? Um, an elective. <laughs> Excuse me, something that you can take unless, of course, you're a history major or something of that nature. And what you learn 
is that there's sort of this fanciful or otherworldly concept behind Grecian or Greeks or Greece that it's this place and if if you look at um photos images of special places within Greece they're always set up on some hill something to be admired to be looked up to to elevate that goes along with their way of thinking. There was a movie that was very popular and I watched it on a number of occasions because it was funny to me. <laughs> Just thinking about it is still funny. But it's not as funny now as it once was for the simple fact that there was more true things spoken in that movie than I would have ever imagined. Much of what they talked about is actually believed. Even stuff that appears to be a punchline, it's actually believed. It's thought to be true. When you think of heroes from the Roman Empire, you could literally draw a parallel, a direct parallel from a Greek hero to a Roman hero, a Greek goddess to a Roman goddess, and on down the line, person for person or myth for myth. And the sad part is, in this nation in which we live, in the Western world in general, they don't even realize that you can draw parallels to beliefs from here to here that have gone to here, from here to here that have gone to here. Do a deep dive and study on that statue in the harbor in New York. Do a deep dive and study about some of those national monuments that people flock to see by the millions. There's a lot of things that you can do a deep dive on in our Western culture. And you'll see that as you drill down to the roots. Look where it goes back to. And I'll just leave that at that. <coughs> Excuse me. The era called the Dark Age of Greece, 900 to 700 BC, was the beginning of the construction of gymnasiums, <clears throat> excuse me. The word gymnos is the Greek word for naked. This period also began the great city-state called the polis, which was designed to confine the social elite. These cities were erected to honor the gods. The key to success in building a city, a state, and yes, even a nation, is infrastructure. Akin to gymnasiums was a smaller structure called a theater, intended to host two primary activities. Initially, it was the place to produce comedies and later Greek tragedies. 
plays. Later on, by the Archaic Age, it hosted the philosophers in their famous debates that are considered must-reads for the serious academic to this day. Brad finishes this chapter and transitions us with this. These debates were originally created to provide a place for the great thinkers and intellects to have a place to out-intellectualize each other. These places would soon produce Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. We will learn some Athenian history in the next teaching chapter 3, and a bit about Socrates and Plato. We've already heard and learned a little, very little, about Aristotle. I don't recall if there's more on him in a later chapter. There may be. I'm trying not to go ahead. I want to keep us sort of on a track where you're getting highlight of chapter, highlight of chapter, and so forth and so on. I want to try and keep transition smooth and so forth. But I really enjoyed sharing this chapter, too, with you, and I hope, hope that you've learned uh, something from it, that it's piqued your interest, and uh, that you will uh, continue to uh, pursue a deeper understanding of these topics. And remember the offer that was a part of uh, part one, and because I'm of recording these and my wife is going to release them at the same time so that you'll be able to read part one, give yourself a little break and then read part two so that it's together but yet you still have a natural break. Uh, there's, there's, there's an offer that was made in association with part one. And, uh, if you hadn't looked at part one yet, hopefully it's too late for you to <laughs> for you to take advantage of the offer because if it's not, then that means that there was no <laughs> response. <laughs> and yes, I can laugh at myself. I don't I, I make it a point not to take myself too serious because after all it's not about me. I want you to take him serious. I want you to take him serious. And uh, I want you to take what we are being taught serious. If you would like to go ahead and get a copy of Let This Mind Be In You, go to Brad and Carol's site at www.wildbranch.org. That's www.wildbranch.org. One quick thing before I say goodbye. My wife made me and got me these uh, business cards uh, that if you would like to have one so that you will have a reference to share this site and this teaching information with a friend or a family member or maybe a stranger you run into and strike up a conversation with, which uh, frequently happens with me, as it did again yesterday. Just say the word and I will send some out to you. We'll make arrangements uh, via communication back and forth and I will get some to you. And I would greatly appreciate it. I'm trying to get this word out as much as possible. There's a sense of urgency. As I watch things unfold around us in the world, and as I am faced with the realities of life, the family recently lost a family member, and we send our condolences <clears throat> to Bobby's family, his wife, daughter, son-in-law, grandchildren, 
which is also my brother-in-law and nieces and nephews. And we want to keep them in our prayers. So before I sign off, if you would join with me for a brief moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but Father, we beseech you uh, this morning on behalf of Bobby Furman's family. Uh, Father, we pray that you would allow your Ruach HaKodesh to be a comfort to them. Uh, Father, to lead them, to guide them, to direct them as they uh, make their uh, arrangements. Uh, Father, we pray that you would allow them to have a sense of comfort and a sense of calm, uh, Father, uh, knowing that you are ultimately in control and the ultimate judge. And Father, we pray that you would um, allow them to receive ample encouragement, a show of true and pure love, and Father, that you would allow them to make it through this difficult time. And we give you all praise, honor, and glory in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you, folks. Shalom Alechem. Peace be upon you and be blessed this day.